Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Jacopo. It's a great pleasure and great honor uh, to be able to deliver a keynote talk at this uh, conference. And I'm afraid I'm not going to present a new work so much as a record of my failure to grapple or to continue with grapple with the problems in application of predictive processing to art. But let me just in a few words explain uh, the specific perspective from which I approach my topic today. I am art historian, professor of art history, and for a long time I have been interested in how people derive meaning from vision aimed at works of art. And quite late in my professional career, in the last decade, I got involved in experimental research on art perception using brain imaging. And as many others, I have been greatly inspired by the intellectual rigor of Bayesian inference and predictive coding and the promises uh, they hold for explaining perception and cognition of art. Lately, however, I have became sort of wary about the rush with which it seems to me the predictive coding is being uh, applied to uh, higher cognitive phenomena, included art. And it just seems to me that uh, all those attempts to apply a predictive processing framework to visual arts uh, can't just compare uh, with the mathematical precision of the computational models with which predictive processing have been applied, for instance, to psychopathology and the realm of mental illness. And actually the problem I have been grappling with is exactly that Matthias just mentioned, namely uh, its problem of conceptual vocabulary. Perception of art undoubtedly is about expectations, but when I as an art historian use the term expectation, uh, isn't it too naive? Isn't it too far away removed from sort of mathematically, statistically precise notion of expectation that theorists of predictive processing are using? So uh, my own strategy or my own intention lately was to focus on really narrow problems and see uh, whether maybe some of the intellectual rigor of predictive processing could be applied to some long-standing problems in art history and art theory. And one such problem, by far not marginal one, is how people misunderstand certain artworks. Misunderstanding and aversion of audiences towards contemporaneous art has been a constant feature in development of modern art since its, since its inception in the second half of 19th century. These reactions of public appear always in specific historical circumstances. Nevertheless, the question is warranted whether there are some common psychological and cognitive mechanisms which underlie them. I shall focus on contrasting two most common types or what I take to be the most two most common types of misunderstanding uh, which appear in visual art in 20th and 21st century. And despite outward similarities, in behavioral manifestations, I believe these two instances can be meaningfully differentiated and perhaps, just perhaps, Bayesian inference and predictive coding framework can be productively applied to account for such a difference. The first type of misunderstanding that I'm going to introduce concerns art of the last few decades and especially different tendencies of conceptual art. Let me start with a quite telling example. Eight years ago, Chalupetsky Prize, which is the annual prize awarded by International Cherry to the best work by young Czech artists under 35 years, thus it's uh, sort of analogous to much more famous Turner Prize in UK, was awarded to already well-established conceptual artist Dominic Lang and his installation East West. Soon afterwards, a scandal of sort unfolded in Czech art world prompted by widely circulated and much commented upon article in the internet magazine on contemporary art. The piece was written by a young art history student. As she pointed out, quote, the jury awarded the first prize to artists who made two round holes in a cardboard wall, which covers the windows of Trade Fair Palace, which is the seat of modern art collection of National Gallery. Thanks to these holes, the visitor will be allegedly able to, abs to observe the red circle of rising and setting sun. During the day, however, 
what remains to be seen is just a hole in a cardboard. It is therefore necessary to begin to assert that categories such as beauty, connection to life, comprehensibility or permanence are not just long surpassed relics of bygone thinking on art, etc. In the following discussion, most art participants supported this view, while minority of art insiders castigated simple-minded who do not understand progressive art. This local affair has, of course, some more famous precedents of scandals involving dismissal and negative attitudes towards conceptual and minimalist art. Suffice it to mention a scandal which erupted in 1976 following the Tate Gallery's acquisition of Carl Andres Equivalent 8, minimalist sculpture object consisting of 120 identical bricks in two layers. The venerable art institution was attacked and ridiculed by lay public and art establishment alike. For instance, the art history journal, the Burlington Magazine, accused it of buying showy work, which may well be regarded in a few decades as fresh. Both these cases involve what can broadly be termed conceptual art and reactions which they embody are anything but, exception, but exceptional. To the contrary, they continue to be fairly common and prevalent vis-a-vis -vis much of contemporary art. At this point, I should make it clear that I definitely don't take such misunderstanding to have a connotation of deficiency on the part of the viewer. There are several possibilities how to account for such responses on the part of audiences. One could, for instance, evoke a concept of taste and argue that progressive art challenges prevailing concept of taste. This was exactly the response, by the way, of curator responsible for purchase of Andreas Briggs, who said whatever has later been seen to have been vital in a period uh, art has usually been unacceptable to established taste in its own way. Or using jargon of critical theory, one might argue along Pierre Bourdieu's notion of culture capital that problem lies with the viewers who do not possess specific codes to decode and appreciate such art. Or we might note a link between the negative reactions to modern art with its perceived lack of meaning and psychological threat of meaninglessness. Such explanations raise some relevant points, but nevertheless, in my view, they have leave much to be, desired, to be desired. And using a bit of introspection, I should say that they do not explain my own indifference to this kind of art. When it comes to modern visual art, I do not consider myself a naive viewer. It has been both my profession as art writer, curator, and professor, and a passion. Yet I find myself largely in agreement with a student's dismissive remark on a hole in a cardboard. The acceptance or dismissal of certain art genre or style is undoubtedly to a large extent a sociological phenomenon. Nevertheless, you will probably agree that such attitudes are rooted in psychological and cognitive response. The question I want to ask then is, can Bayesian inference and predictive coding provide a suitable conceptual framework within which to address such a phenomenon, I take, or I shall take a very rough shot at the problem. As you will recall, the basic tenet of hierarchical predictive coding states that the brain compares prior beliefs or hypotheses with sensory data, and whenever incoming data violate these predictions and prediction error is generated to update the model at higher levels. To simplify things mightily, we can say that art perception generate prediction error, triggering interpretive process, which is rewarding, as outlined by Sandra van Kruis and Johan Wagemann in their original paper. In visual art, a meaningful encounter starts with visual sensations, and given the evolutionary constraints on our visual system, it, ine <clears throat> it inevitably entails process of recognition and identification of visual, that is, pictorial scene. I have myself already suggested that the deeper experience of work of art requires that viewers are able to tune or adapt their prediction mechanism, that it hinges on their implicit ability to create and temporarily sustain a productive flow of prediction errors across hierarchical levels. Now, if we accept the claim that art explores the predictive capacities of our brain, we see that in these two examples, it fails to do so. In Lang case, and to some extent Andrea case as well, the sensory perceptual expertise experience for most viewers ends in instant recognition and identification. 
A hole in a cardboard is instantly seen as just dead. A hole in a cardboard. A block of bricks is explained away as a block of bricks. Correctly predicted states are not needed for the actualization of priors and therefore are evaluated as non-salient and dull. There are no prediction errors to correct predictions, or if there is one, it is minimized instantly, and once the minimization of prediction error at the level of object recognition is concluded, there is no motivation for fair reviewing and engagement with the work. Whatever meanings and intentions such work is said to have, for instance, Karl Andre described his work as conveying a sense of wading in breaks and like quote, stepping from water of one death to water of another death. And the meaning of Lang's installation was by one critic related to fact to the fact that visitors cannot in fact see sunset or sunrise through the circular aperture because they are restricted by visitor regulations. Hence the work can be seen as a critical comment on the functioning of public institutions. So whatever meanings and associations are read into such works, often in six theoretical jargon, they tend to be divorced from sensory evidence. The hermeneutical cycle in which seeing triggers complex interplay of predictions which would spend every level within the hierarchical structure of the mind brain is not activated. Now, if we talk about aversion or hostility towards such works, <clears throat> these may well be secondary, resulting from viewers' implicit appraisal of experience, which is one of indifference and boredom. Such a situation can be seen to collide head to head with expectation, borne out through encounters with classic modern art, that works of art, in order to be found as rewarding, should offer opportunity for perceptually rich encounter, that they should provide challenge of some sort to perception, perhaps at the level of recognition. And if they happen to provide no perceptual challenge, they still provide some incentive for motivated, motivating seeing, motivated seeing. In other words, this high level expectation might be set to pre-tune our prediction system for encounter with artwork. Importantly, my two examples of negative response are separated by almost half a century, which means they should be considered as a phenomenon with historical dimension and they appear to be resistant to quick accommodation of the shock of new in art, which was, which was described by art historian Leo Steinberg in his essay, Contemporary Art and the Plight of its Public, published in 1962. Here Steinberg insists that the shock of discomfort or the bewilderment or the anger or the burden which people feel when confronted with an unfamiliar new style is short term. His main thesis is that, quote, no art seems to remain uncomfortable for very long. Steinberg might have been right about some artistic styles and uh, it's relevant to the case I shall be discussing in a moment, but it doesn't hold true for conceptual art. Continuing indifference toward and dismissal of much contemporary art by general audiences testifies that the expectation I have just mentioned, namely that there should be something interesting and rewarding to be perceptually accomplished continues to hold sway over audiences. Such hyper prior obviously has not been suppressed by cumulative experience of several decades of exposition to conceptual art. I shall now turn to another instance of misunderstanding, one which involves numerous well-documented cases of dismissive reactions to early modern avant-garde, typically cubist, expressionist and abstract art. Although outwardly they are similar to negative reaction to conceptual art, I believe that they represent a structurally different case from the one just discussed. Digging into early 20th century art criticism and journalism, one finds endless string of dismissive judgments and derogatory comments in which phrases like bizarre anatomies, deformations, inconsistencies, contortions abound, and such art is pronounced as being ugly and incomprehensible. But rather than quoting from such sources, I shall enlist the help of none other than Ernst Panofsky, the great art historian and theorist of the 20th century. In, 19, in 1931, Panofsky has published one of his theoretically most far-reaching paper entitled Describing and Interpreting Works of the Visual Art. 
This brilliant essay was a programmatic exposition on the method of describing works of art, out of which he later developed his famous method of iconology and iconography. Importantly, it contains a brief passage on contemporary art, which eschews any value judgments, but provides a comment most pertinent for my discussion. It merits an extended quote. The, I quote, we only have to imagine a painting by Franz Marc instead of the Grunewald, for instance, the mandrill in the Hamburger Kunsthalle to realize that while we might have all the concepts to uncover the phenomenal meaning at our disposal, it is not always possible simply to apply them to the artwork in question. In banal terms, it is not always easy to recognize what is portrayed in the picture. We may know what the kind of monkey called mandrill is, but in order to recognize him in the picture, we have to be, we have to be tuned to principles of expressionist representation, which govern the design here. In 1919, the people of Hamburg were unable to identify the object painted by Franz Marc because they were not yet familiar with the representational principles of expressionism. It is apparent that to grasp even the most mundane of experiential conception of features or features in a picture and hence offer an appropriate description depends upon familiarity with the general representation of principles." Unquote. Panofsky, in fact, doesn't say anything about those people of Hamburg being aversive or hostile to modern art as a result of their not being able to recognize the painted object. But many other critical sources of this period make this explicit link. Avant-garde art is dismissed or ridiculed for incomprehensible way of portraying things. Some other authors writing at a time when new art was arriving were sympathetic to challenges that avant-garde art presented to audiences. For instance, art critic Ellie Four writes in 1909, if the public took the trouble to learn the artist language, if it would simply recognize that there is a language of art that is fairly difficult to understand. Now, avant-garde artists themselves defending their works to less charitable views, as for instance, Cubist painter André Pouconier writes about new conception of the picture, which presenting itself is an unexpectedness that may be disorienting for lazy minds. What Panofsky calls representational principles have been extensively discussed in art historical writings, and having no time to develop on them, suffice it at least to mention a few formal modernist innovation at the level of constitutive, constitutive elements of the painting and stylistic innovations, such as abolition of perspective and lighting, atomization of picture surface into separate brush strokes, reducing pictures fictive depth, dissolution of the picture into texture, um, geometric stylization of volumes, etc. Such, <clears throat> such stylistic and formal innovations, increasingly apparent in visual art since the last quarter of the 19th century, updated and or directly constrained representational, contradicted representational principles, which generated perceptual and cognitive expectations with which audiences approached pre modern art. So, how can we account in terms of predictive coding? potentially, for what happened when people began to encounter paintings such as Marx's Mandrill. Uh, according to Bayesian and predictive coding models of visual recognition, reciprocally connected cortical areas engage in a dynamic process in which predictions are modified based on incoming sensory input until the higher level region is able to arrive at some reasonable approximation of the incoming stimulus. It is previous experience and perceptual expertise that generates distinct set of expectations which determine interpretation of the image. We may thus assume that for those people of Hamburg upon encountering Mandrill in 1919, predictions were out of tune with ambiguous sensory input. Ensuing prediction error was of such magnitude that it couldn't have been meaningfully minimized given existing priors. In other words, Input features were not explanatory enough to connect with whatever model the view, generative model the viewer possessed. If general in predictive coding framework, brain can minimize prediction error either through acting on environment, thus changing the sensory input, or it can change its posterior beliefs by changing its internal states, neither option, neither option seems to be available or would suffice in this situation. So let me summarize these two 
two kinds of misunderstanding of art I have been outlining, admittedly in a very rough fashion. In the first case, typified by conceptual installations, failure of much contemporary art to incite an interest on the part of audience may stem from the fact that the encounter result in non saligned visual sensations and generates no prediction error. If it does, prediction error does not update whatever generative model there exists. On the other hand, in case of perception of cubist expressionist or abstract art as typified by Mandrill, uh, they were too noisy and couldn't coalesce uh, as typified by Mandrill and Sri. For contemporaneous audience, sensations defied an overtaxed explanatory framework. They were too noisy and couldn't coalesce into meaningful percept and again failed to connect with higher priors. Common to both instances of misunderstanding, in my view, then, is the inability of the viewer to explain away sensory input through top down prediction and to sustain productive cycle of predictive error minimization which characterizes the hermeneutic act of viewing and meaning making. What needs, what needs emphasizing is that these two instances of incomprehension have different dynamics of development. As we have seen, the incomprehension of conceptual art is something which extends over more than half a century and has proven largely resistant to change. However, in our second case, the situation is different for within the same time span of half a century, the hostility and aversion to avant-garde modernist art gave way to general acceptance and admiration of majority of, of art-loving audience as testified by success of large exhibitions and museum collections. This change of attitude visible through museum attendance, statistics, audience research, and so on, is also attested to by contemporary psychological research, which suggests that mastering ambiguous and disfluent art may be especially pleasurable and rewarding. The exciting question to my, uh, in my view is, is of course this, how can we explain potentially using predictive processing framework that within several decades, people had no problem to perceptually understand works such as Marx Mandrill and such works came to be massively enjoyed by museum going public. Acceptance of course presupposes that it's rewarding and enjoyable, that it has been in some way understood which in turn presupposes that it has been perceptually recognized and identified. I don't have straightforward answer for that, but I will offer some speculative ideas, but to do this, let us for a moment turn to brief and very provisional considerations of hierarchy of expectations involved in art perception. There is some consensus in predictive coding literature that hyper priors are evolutionary selected more abstract and fundamental priors. In Andy Clark's words, they are priors upon priors embodying system, <clears throat> systemic expectations concerning very abstract features of the world. Many priors could be innate and, and biologically hardwired, yet, as some authors proposed, couch determines and constrains hyper priors needed by a predictive neural system. I agree, but. Uh, Following Matthias, I worry that um, proposals regarding the hierarchically higher cultural levels of predictive processing remains extremely sketchy. Austrian anthropologist Hans Jonas has called humans homo pictor or image making creatures and indeed depiction alongside language is a key symbolic and communication system. I have earlier suggested that the likely candidate for the central and neighboring hyper prior operating in visual art perception, operating in uh, visual art, uh, art perception is the general pictorial competence and the capacity of seeing in seeing as that is the ability of human observer to see a certain object in a depictive configuration on a pictorial surface to see through the depiction to its reference and at the same time to the nature of the relation between representation and referent. This capacity is a result of long evolution as interpretation of prehistoric archeological finds suggest, part of ontogeny as well. It has been demonstrated that pictorial competence is partly being acquired de novo in human infants. <clears throat> 
But the general ability to see objects in images is always realized through specific representational systems, which are to a large extent culturally determined. So we have the local specific horizons for art production and consumption of images. Uh, at this point, we get into the problematics which has already been discussed by Matthias, namely the problem of culturality of vision. So I will skip this part. Uh, just uh, mentioning the potential that, uh, to me at least, there is a tempting possibility to make the concept of history of vision or Pax Sandals period I somehow compatible with the conceptual vocabulary of biasing, inference, and predictive coding. But alongside these culture specific local horizon of horizons of visual and cognitive skills and expectations, another high level abstract hyper prior gradually emerge. The one we have already discussed, namely that the experience of visual artwork may bring challenge to our <clears throat> perceptual routines, that it may involve effort for coming to terms with what is visibly depicted and may prompt extensive self-reflection. And that this very taxing of cognitive and perceptual routines might ultimately prove to be rewarding. Indeed, this expectation that art is challenging to the point that depicted object cannot be easily recognized is at some extreme set up against or directly thwarts the higher hyper, hyper prior that to the representations convey the appearance of subjects. So in a very provisional fashion, we might begin to outline a hierarchy of hyper priors with general pictorial competence uh, seeing in, in the highest level uh, and that one is always realized through those cultural specific visual competencies. Uh, we can even assume that such an expectation has been fed um, <clears throat> uh, below it. There is that uh, artwork present a challenge sort of hyper prior and below it yet another one that may have developed over the last couple of decades as a result of uh, exposition to conceptual art in some viewers who might be happy with the fact that artworks need not provide a sense of gratification and can operate on purely conceptual level. Hence, seeing just a hole in a cardboard or a pile of bricks for what it is can nevertheless instantiate a meaningful process of predictive error minimization. Now for the final part of my talk, I shall go shortly back to my Marx Mandrill and his audience. Let's one again hear Panofsky. Experience has taught us that this Mandrill, which may appear innocuous today, could not even be identified at the time of its purchase, because as people went about desperately looking for his snout so as to get their bearings. But where people of Hamburg in 1919 were once left without access to the picture, Today, the general museum visitor or art member of art loving audience would presumably have no problem to, to agree with contemporary art historian who writes, the powerful ape is composed of all the colors in the chromatic spectrum and it seems as if it is willingly distinguishing itself from the other colors and forms. One is able to clearly make out a head with a long snout and a mop of hair, etc. So to repeat, if we accept the thesis that art explores and depends on the predictive capacities of our brains and minds, the question we are faced is this, what exactly had to change in the architecture of predictive system for audiences to recognize Mandrill or any other ambiguous motif in modern art and to start understanding and enjoying such pictures? And secondly, how could it, could it have changed so quickly and attain a collective dimension? Perhaps simplest way to begin answering these questions is to say that in order to learn how to recognize objects in modernist works of art, people had to acquire perceptual expertise. In our case, the required expertise translates into updating a number of priors. For instance, a major source of difficulty in correct identification in the mandrail is the elimination of figure ground distinction by the painter. This would seem to conflict with the evolutionary established expectation uh, confirmed by recent research that objects are convex and backgrounds are homogeneously colored. 
such structural prior established over a long evolutionary time scale would have to be modulated or replaced by a short term contextual prior that in modernist painting this may no longer apply and that the objects have to be priced so to speak out of the homogeneous background uh, another expectation in need of updating is related to suppression of pictorial death in the image the viewer has now to obtain a sense of three-dimensional object out of flatbed pictorial plane now we know that the content of prediction error is determined by new neuronal circuits in which they are generated. So for instance, prediction errors generated within visual processing hierarchy are related to primary visual features such as orientation and contrast. The challenge for me, uh, open challenge uh, with which I, am, I started to grapple recently is whether we could try to deeply analyze picture, for instance, this mandrel, starting with a catalog of art historical description of those formal and stylistic innovations uh, that would impinge on a on a on the ability of visual system to recognize the object and to see whether they could be meaningfully mapped into uh, the neuronal hierarchy of predictive predictive processing uh, in other words whether we could try to model how uh, the art specific constraints and innovations can be related to some formal statistically more rigorous uh, predictive processing framework at this point you might want you might want to object that i have been focusing merely on perceptual recognition identification at the expense of higher cognitive and affective operation and that in trying to, uh, to explain how mandrill came to be understood, there must be taken, uh, there are other aspects that must be equally taken into account. And you would be of course right. I have done so principally for two reasons. First, in trying to conceptualize the process of meaning making in experience of visual artwork, the level of perceptual recognition is absolutely essential. And heuristically, I hope that this brief exposition can demonstrate that even if the problem of how people came to un understand modern art is narrowed down uh, to their developing perceptual expertise, it is at present exceedingly difficult to translate into the some sort of rigorous neurobiologically plausible descriptions in terms of predictive coding. But of course, the feat of learning the language of new art which the lazy minds ridiculed by Fauconnier had to accomplish was not just to perform identification and recognition of the object in a pictorial scene or three-dimensional sculpture, but to use such ability to arrive at coherent percepts from new representational conventions and consequently to generate new predictions about the meaning and effects of the work and the meaning of such experience itself. So alongside perceptual exper expertise, the updating of predictive architecture had to include the new high level expectations, including the one I, I mentioned that the recognition and identification may be disfluent, might not always be resolved, but actually, ultimately it may set up new priors, uh, which again will be subverted and uh, that productive and revolving cycle of uh, iteration that uh, Sandra van der Kruis, Kreis, uh, Johann Wagemans and myself have described can ensue. But the problem remain obvious. While we now possess reasonably detailed knowledge about how prediction errors at lower levels of processing hierarchy are neural, neurally encoded, there is no viable model to my knowledge of how they percolate to higher levels of cognition and certainly up to the top levels of hyperpriors I have been discussing. There is, and here I repeat what uh, what uh, Matthias already said, to the best of my knowledge, no plausible account of how the higher level culturally determined hyperpriors may constrain and interact with the lower levels of predictive system. Finally, we know that prediction errors update our model of the world either on the short term through inference or long term through learning. I wonder if predictive coding can shed some light on the social dynamics of this 
coming to terms with mandrill or modern art, or what I would like to call epidemiology of expectation updating, how perceptual and cognitive expertise required to understand modern work of art and ultimately to turn such perception into enjoyable experience could spread within a few decades from narrow circle of cognoscending to large audiences. I have some ideas here, but uh, I think I have used my time. So let me con <clears throat> conclude by a personal note. I do not necessarily share those views which categorically claim that predictive processing and free energy principle are not fit for modeling culture. And I remain open to exploring the possibilities uh, those frameworks give for reconceptualizing so, some old and much discussed issues in art theory and art history. At the same time, as my talk hopefully suggested, predictive processing theory uh, is, is a long way uh, of uh, going uh, to account uh, for the modeling interaction between those lower levels of hierarch hierarchical predictive system and higher levels of culturally instantiated hyper prior. Thus, it is my view that it is far, far away from being able to provide unifying framework for the neurocognitive basis of art and aesthetic perception and experience. At any rate, it may well be that art and aesthetic phenomena will increasingly become testing ground for potential of predictive coding to account for some of the most complex accomplishments the human mind is capable of. Thank you.